is uh, Tobias Niederwieser. I'm a professor here at CU Boulder uh, in the United States, and I'm also part of Biosurf, which is a center within the university, um, which I will talk about today. And my talk is called Space Experiments and Manufacturing from ISS to Artemis and Commercial Space Stations. So let me um, get you a brief overview of, of Biosurf. As I said, we are a center within the University of Colorado. Uh, we have been around for quite some time, since 1987, and have done, I think, as of yesterday, 90 uh, launches since 1991. Um, and what is, um, I think, special to us is that we have a lot of student engagement so um, while we do professional experiments in, in the space um, environment, space life science experiments, we do have a lot of students that help us to design and, and conduct these experiments in space and get hands-on um, exposure to spaceflight hardware. Um, <clears throat> what kind of experiments are we talking about? We are really focused on the biological side of things, um, specifically cell cultures. So we do a lot of mammalian cells, meaning human cells, microbial, tissue engineering, uh, all that kind of stuff. We've done some biology in terms of animals in the past and plants, but not so much these days. Um, but in addition to biology, we also do some um, uh, physical and material science. So for example, protein crystal growth experiments um, is, is the example I chose. Um, as the area of expertise here. So really everything that is living uh, or has something to do with fluids is, is usually our domain. Um, we have done, um, we have been around for over 35 years, done these uh, over 90 missions now um, and fly on pretty much every single resupply flight uh, that goes up to the space station from the US at the moment. But really what is most important is that our scientific outcome um, where we praise ourselves to do high impact science with every of our experiments. And that is reflected in those 350 referee journal articles that we have <clears throat> made over the time. Um, here's just a quick history, uh, a snapshot of our uh, flight history, the, the last couple of flights. And um, as I said, two days ago, on SpaceX 27, we had two more experiments, uh, both heart tissue experiments that flew up and will be conducted probably uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and then the uh, Sally incubator. So this is a new science facility that we brought up um, two days ago as well. Um, and this is a really good overview of, of just what we do. And I think um, why, why we are so successful of doing these um, uh, space experiments um, is because we we offer an end-to-end -end solution. So we don't just only provide hardware or only uh, operations. We do we do really everything together. So in the <coughs> upper left there, <coughs> sorry, um, you see uh, the hardware deep that we have developed to allow those space experiments. So these centrifuges, incubators, microscopes, um, multi-well plates, that kind of things. And we'll talk about them a little bit more on the upper right you um, see the operations. So we really have a nail down how to efficiently use the crew to do these experiments and get even in situ analysis. Um, we have this control center here in Boulder, Colorado um, that you see in the lower left. Um, that is really our funnel point where all the data comes in and we talk to the astronauts to do our experiments. But then since we're also part of the university, some of the science um, we also do ourselves um, since we are tied so well here in academia. Even so, 95% of our science definitely is coming from outside PIs that just want to use our expertise and facilities to conduct their experiments uh, in space. So um, usually what happens is if one of these scientists comes, he has a pictures just like on the left of what his lab looks like um, on, on Earth. And he made this um, experiment on Earth and now wants to fly it in space. And this is what the ISS looks like and where we are doing our experiments. And so our job really is to take whatever the scientist comes to us and as best as possible translate that into the space environment there on the right. 
And here's just a couple of examples what that entails. Um, so you, you see even um, the science containers, like the test tubes or the Petri dishes or multi-well plates, which is just the, the, the bare standard in any biological lab. Um, uh, we cannot really use in space just because it's open, um, it's too, it doesn't have enough level of containment, that kind of stuff. So we, over the years, have built these equivalents um, of, the, um, of the test tubes, the petri dishes, and the multi-well plates. Um, but then even something as simple as just, oh, I'm warming up my cells in a water bath. Well, that doesn't exist and doesn't work the same way in microgravity. So we developed, for example, a, a saw system, which is very you know, uh, low complexity kind of uh, system, but it, it is something that has to be fleshed out too, just to warm up the cells the same way that you do on Earth, so you can compare them to Earth. And then we get to some more complex systems, um, like an incubator. We have uh, Sable developed, which is really our workhorse in space, microscopes, uh, refrigerator freezers, um, and uh, biosafety cabinets. So uh, except for the LST down the right, all of these uh, items have been developed, built, manufactured, assembled, tested, and uh, flown to the ISS by Biosurf and are now even owned uh, still by Biosurf. Um, so let me talk a little bit kind of what uh, happens to an experiment once it is in space. Um, and as I said before, really our center anchor is Sable, which is the space automated by a product lab. And you see it here in the center, these two units on top of each other that have the two black uh, touch screens on top of them. And uh, what is Sable? Um, well, <clears throat> it is most and foremost an incubator, so it can do temperature control. Um, and the, the, the unique thing about these space incubators is they can heat and cool at the same time. So they go from minus five degrees Celsius to plus 43. So we can um, do refrigerated, refrigeration temperatures at 4C uh, in those incubators, but we can also do 20 degrees Celsius for uh, ambient studies, which is very common, or probably the most common is 37 degrees Celsius um, to mimic the temperature of the human body for all human kind of tissues. Um, then we also have the capability to add a CO2 control to it, and we'll talk to that in a second. And we have 23 liters of volume inside, which is quite a large volume, and you can see that here, that is temperature controlled. And we have trays and things to put in there to organize the inside a little bit. But it's not just temperature. You can see here on the left, there is some ports um, that uh, can be used for the automated part of Sable. So there's USB and ethernet and power connections. So we are able to put smart experiments to the inside, meaning we can measure something with sensors inside your experiment. We can have actuators to, uh, to do something. We can have uh, pumps to pump media around. So it's, it's quite uh, a capable facility. And I think that is um, uh, proven by the fact that we had three of these on board the space station since 2016. And they have operated ever since and um, are pretty much used every single flight. Um, new experiments come up. These are, these are at full capacity. Um, I mentioned that we can do 5% CO2. Um, so that is actually an insert that we can put into Sable to get to this 5% CO2. You see it's a little uh, square box and we can slide it into the back. So you lose two inches of your interior volume. Um, if you put that in, but you gain the um, the capability to now have 5% CO2, which um, if you do human cell cultures, uh, you can talk to any scientist that is the golden standard of how you get your pH right in these cultures. And it is how pretty much all human cell cultures on earth have been done. So if you don't have these 5% CO2, you really can't compare to other um, studies that have been done in the history of mankind for these uh, human cell cultures. So uh, we have this only 5% CO2 incubator um, that is actively controlled on the ISS. And with that, that allows us to have this high um, quality science just because you can compare your results to all results that have been done on the ground. Um, talking about experiment activation, 
Um, we have a couple of different methods of how we bring experiments up to the space station. Um, this can be live, so we can launch live cells <clears throat> to the ISS, um, meaning we at the launch site put them in uh, the containers and then hand them over 24 hours before launch kind of thing, launch them up. And as soon as they're up on the space station, um, the, the, they do a media exchange or something like that. Um, but there's other methods too. For example, we can bring up lyophilized cells, meaning they're freeze dried. We can freeze them uh, or bring them up frozen and then warm them up on orbit to start um, preserved. Um, so there, there's a couple different methods here. And what you can see in um, this picture here is our gap unit. Um, and that is a very simple kind of experiment um, that we can run very efficient. Um, so in, in one gap, there's uh, eight of these uh, tubes. And these tubes are glass tubes. And you see they have different compartments. There's little stoppers in between them. So there's one example. We can have two to, uh, I think, five or six of these compartments. This experiment shows four. So you see, for example, that white would be the gross medium. Uh, yellow would be the inoculum. In this case, they had an antibiotic um, that is orange and then a fixative that is blue at the very end. And you can bring this up like this um, and it's completely passive, like nothing is growing. Um, it's stable for a few days, I guess. Um, and, and there's no experiment happening. So launch effects are not a factor. Once you're now in microgravity, um, there's a little crank you can attach to the top and start pushing things down. And what that does is this blue arrow on the right side, there's a little, uh, a rod that goes in there that pushes these stoppers down. And you see this little bypass there in the tube. So if you push it far enough, the yellow goes to the bypass and now yellow with white can mix. And in this case, the inoculum, so the bacteria was starting to grow in the gross medium. Um, and you put it in your uh, incubator for a couple of days and have a controlled growth. After a couple of days, you take it out, you push a little further, now the antibiotic can start to act and uh, do its thing. We put it back in the incubator for a couple of days. And then after a few more days, you take it out and push it even further. So now the fixative can go into your chamber too. And you have terminated your experiment. And now you can freeze it or just bring it down ambient. Um, and you have completed your experiment the entire time while you were in space. There was no part of this experiment that has been conducted on the ground. So um, we have fl flown hundreds of these uh, tubes, and uh, this is just one, one kind of very simple experiment that we can do. Um, if it gets to a little bit more complex experiments, we can do media exchanges. Um, for that, we usually use this glove box on the ISS. It's called either the LSG or the MSG. And for that, we usually use our biocell. So the biocell is really the petri dish in microgravity. and um, we can do attached and suspended cells in those, in those bio cells, um, but it's fully contained. So there's no liquid coming out anywhere, um, but it still has permeable membranes. So you still get the gas exchange. So CO2 and oxygen can go in and out of these uh, bio cells for cell metabolism. And uh, you can fit it under a microscope. So you can do a microscopy of these things. And you see there are some ports so inlet and outlet and sample ports. Um, so you can attach syringes and put in um, or exchange the media with keeping your suspended cells in those bio cells. Um, but you also can take samples at different time points, but you can also put in a fixative, for example, at the end to uh, preserve your, your samples. And we have probably 50 different varieties of these bio cells. Here you see the single valve version of it, but we also have up to 12 well versions of these. Um, so it's really, it's really more than a petri dish. It's, it's also the multi-well plates um, version for microgravity. And we have, we have also flown these hundreds of times um, uh, with lots of different cells, lots of mammalian cells like stem, heart, bone, cancer cells. But we've also done other biological experiments like bacteria, biofilm experiments, or grown yeast uh, in there. Um, so one example is that we did a cancer experiment. Um, they were, and you actually see down there, we have used the six well version of this uh, bio cell down there. Um, this is a, a company, a startup that was 
looking at uh, drugs for cancers. And um, in the lab, the 2D cell cultures stay on the top left is how the cell, the, the cancers that they grew in the lab looked like. And they looked very different than they look in a human body, which is more like 3D that you see there on the right. Um, and so by going into space, we were able to, to grow these 3D spheroids and uh, they could test that drug much better because if you have this gigantic surface area of a 2D culture, you might get um, wrong ideas of how your drug works. Um, so they, they, they were able to test that drug as it would be in the human body. Um, but then we also can do in situ analysis. So we have this full uh, scientific grade microscope that we modified and brought up to the space station. It's a Nikon microscope. It can do uh, bright field microscopy and phase contrast. Um, in theory, it can also do fluorescence. Um, but um, we don't, it, it needs some more parts to do that. And um, there was just not demand yet to do that fluorescent part of it. Um, but there's some uh, samples that you see here of pictures that we have taken with this microscope. Um, so micro 16 was an E. coli payload. They were looking at these worms of how they move in space and how strong they are uh, of moving these pillars around. We have done heart cells before in 2016, same as uh, we just launched uh, two days ago and then just uh, for different purposes, but both of them, all of them were heart cells. Um, and you can actually see them beating. And if this would be a video and not a picture, which is really cool. And then again, some of these protein crystals, which just look very cool uh, in space uh, and very different than in microgravity. And um, we have really perfected this way of using this microscope efficiently. So you see it's first of all out of in the open and you can just put a plate under and and uh, quickly focus and then swap out samples. But then you also see in the background there, there's the screen of Sable actually on. And we can show the uh, crew member on this display, the picture of, of, of the microscope. And the benefit of doing that is that we see the same picture live on the ground and can really help with the help of the PI, uh, the, the, the astronaut to do good science imagery for us. Uh, and life. Um, and then coming to one of the more complex kind of things, we can also do experiment manipulation, which is really just a broad word, but um, um, we can, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do with, with these experiments in space. So in, in this is just one example where um, we had to do um, uh, organ chips, uh, organs on a chip uh, experiments, and they are very, high maintenance, meaning that they need media exchanges 24-7. Uh, so it's called perfusion. And they need that even while you hand it over in the launch site, while it launches, while the astronaut takes it out of the spacecraft, uh, all that kind of things. It continuously has to be powered and um, move fluid through those tissue chips because they're organs, right? And if organs don't get their... Um, uh, uh, media, then they start dying off. So this was kidney cells. And um, we built this little uh, shoe box that actually can house 36 samples of uh, kidney organs in it. And uh, this is kind of the evolution it took. So on the left, you see the lab again of um, how they are doing it. And you see this gigantic incubator staff standing there. They have a armada of syringe pumps at the top, and there's just tubes everywhere. Um, which is obviously not possible to fly that and much too big and, and, and much too uh, vulnerable to all the, the space flight environments. So we took that and brought it from 48 cubic feet that it took up in the lab into two cubic feet that you see there on the right. Um, so that this is something that we're also capable of. It's, of course, much more expensive because we have to build up a, a system from the ground up, but we are capable of really taking anything you you give us and um, if you don't have the right solution already for it, which we have for most of the things, um, we can really design something that works great. And this actually has flown twice so far and uh, was both times um, successful. Um, and then lastly, um, this is what we see of the experiments that happens on the space station. So we have this great control center here in Boulder. 
Um, it is. It has a glass wall to our to the university, so uh, everyone can come and watch. Um, and we have students sitting there in the front that are supervising all the technical data that are coming in and, and taking protocols. And then the back row, we have a position where we can um, talk directly to the astronauts. And then we have this big screen there in the front where uh, we have the, we call it the older the over the shoulder view, um, where we can check the astronaut um, on how they do their experiments. And um, this was what we kind of do today. And this is all on board the International Space Station. But I said I would uh, go into a little bit of the future, what the future looks like for space experiments. Um, so one big hot topic, at least as NASA at the moment, is in space manufacturing. And um, the I'm sure you've heard of these four space stations that, um, that uh, are currently developing their concepts or even building some parts um, to to be the, um, the next step after the International Space Station. And um, of course, we will continue to do um, these experiments on these space stations. But, but what they're really looking for is this in-space manufacturing um, to develop a product on the space station to make a business case and then bring it down to Earth and, and be able to sell it on, on, on Earth. So we have a couple of different um, projects that are going on. Um, we are looking at stem cell experiments right now, um, where we can produce stem cells in space because it's a better microgravity environment up there to, to keep them stem cells. Um, like the cancer one, we're looking at drug developments. Um, so there's, there's drugs that can be developed much better in space than on, on the ground. And um, lastly, uh, also organoid production is another area of, of, of uh, current interest. Um, so that might just be parts of organs that we're printing or complete organs. Um, and it might also be tied to stem cells because you can use your own stem cells to print an organ that is yours instead of taking a donor organ, for example. But there is there's much more um, uh, options for, for these um, products. Um, this is just three that I that I picked out, um, and it's really cool because we can use the ISS as a test bed. So to do one-off small-scale experiments right now on board the ISS. So when these when these labs are either up and running or even right now, we can inform how a large-scale production facility um, would look like to make lots of these. Um, experiments um, or uh, production runs uh, on these platforms. And um, we are using manual labor a lot for, um, for these one-off experiments, just because they're so different every single time. And we have great flexibility. Um, we have really fast turnaround times because we don't have to develop automated systems to, to make them happen. We can just uh, get the experiment and, and start the integration and fly uh, up to six months or a minimum of six months later to uh, the space station. Um, for the production, we of course would have automated systems just because it's a very repetitive task. Um, it would be from, instead of 15 milliliters, it would be more like liters at end of, of, of fluids that we have to move around. Um, so um, there's definitely a big element of robotics coming in once um, you have your process defined and just do it over and over again. Um, and then we are living in a very exciting time where we are expanding outside of low Earth orbit. So just for reference, the ISS is here on the left with all the resupply vehicles that are either flying already or will fly in the near future. Um, but all of that is happening within the radiation belt of Earth, so within the Van Allen belt. Um, we now have some uh, vehicles that have already flown, like Orion outside these uh, radiation belts. And there's also Gateway, of course, that's currently under construction, which is just for reference, a thousand times further than the ISS is away from us. So it boasts a space and it seems the same, but there's a big difference because here on the ISS, you mainly do studies for microgravity. Orion and Gateway, all of a sudden, you have the capability to do radiation studies because you have unshielded deep space radiation uh, on those platforms. So uh, one experiment that we have already flown on this uh, Artemis 1 mission of Orion 
um, is deep space radiation genomics. And we built um, this also shoebox, shoebox looking uh, device that is fully automated already because there were no humans on board that um, platform. Um, and we were looking at the effect of radiation on the DNA of those yeast cells. And it was inside Orion and mounted below the seats uh, uh, here uh, in these two boxes. And um, the cool thing is that we flew one experiment on the on Orion. We will fly one experiment on the ISS because we need a control. Um, and we have one ground control on Earth. And why do we need two controls? Well, on Artemis, we have radiation and microgravity. So if you just ran the ground control, we wouldn't know if the changes are due to radiation or microgravity. So we need the ISS to only have microgravity, but no radiation to um, uh, distinguish between those three different factors. And here's just some pictures of how this was loaded into a Orion capsule here on the left. It was actually loaded on the launch pad uh, while it was sitting there, which was uh, extremely cool. And then we actually see saw some flight images um, of the cockpit and this blue bag is where the uh, unit was uh, inside of so it was really just behind the seat you see here is the puppet astronauts so that's where the astronauts will sit and of course some cool pictures um, of the Orion capsule with moon and earth in one view and we did get the experiment back um, uh, in, in, in December and uh, we are able to say that it successfully grew um, yeast in space. So they were visible with the bare eye. Uh, we verified since that there was no contamination and it just went to DNA sequencing. So um, uh, we are very happy that we will have some results just um, based on the fact that everything activated on time and it actively grew, which um, is a really big deal because we haven't done an experiment like this in 50 years. Um, there has not been done any biologic experiment that came back to the Earth for analysis. And uh, the real reason we are doing this is because yeast and humans are very similar. 70% of DNA is, is similar between the two of us. And um, with doing yeast, we hope to be able to make conclusions on what would happen to humans um, if they would be for long times in that deep space radiation environment. And then, uh, of course, it goes further with Gateway and going to lunar surface. And um, we are just starting to get into that field uh, too, because it's very exciting and we can do radiation experiments or even ISRU experiments on the, on the surface of the moon. And uh, we have recently gotten contracts to develop the new payload enclosure. There's this box that you see on the left which uh, in, the, in the gateway, you see there's these slots for experiments and they're standardized. So um, all experiments will have to go in one of these um, boxes that we're currently developing to uh, help do very efficient uh, experiments in space. And uh, we're also here on the right are working on automated systems and that have microscopes and media exchanges included in, in, in the system. Um, so you're not using crew time because crew time on the gateway will be pretty much non-existent in the future. So all of that has to be automated. So we are, we are definitely looking forward to expand in that area at the moment as well. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And um, definitely feel free to check out our website down here in the link or um, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Sure. Well. I mean, wow, uh, probably I'm not the only one who is saying wow in, in the session today, but because definitely it's so many different insights in terms of, uh, you know, space experiments and research and, and looking into the future, you know, what the, what is that going to bring for, for the people and in terms of different research aspects. So, but we have a one question, so which is a more general question towards how much time do, uh, do you dedicate to, to scientific research and experiments at ISS? and in man hours per week, right? And, and what's the percent of the astronauts time that's also dedicated for that, for that research? Yeah, very good uh, question. Um, so it, it definitely has, has changed much over the, over the time. So in the space shuttle, we have made mostly automated experiments because crew time was very limited. They were only up there for 10 days. 
They were busy flying a space shuttle, doing the main uh, mission and uh, adapting to space. But now on the space station, since they're living there for six months, there is actually a significant amount of uh, of crew time available. I, I don't I don't know if I know a, a precise number, um, but I think most of our experiments take um, a few hours um, of of crew time. I would say um, some of them that are crazy complex. I didn't mention this, but we also do some rodent research work um, that takes days at ends of crew time um, just because they do mouse dissections sometimes in, in space environments. So it really, it really depends on, on the type of experiment um, that we are doing. But I think uh, to give you an idea for the future, NASA has put out that on these commercial space stations, they want to have two crew members uh, up there um, that are fully um, responsible for experiments. So you have, uh, I guess, two two workers um, uh, for a full work week. So I guess that's um, 80 hours per week of crew time that will be available uh, on these commercial space stations from NASA in terms of crew time is, I think, the current plan. Perfect. Well, Thank you again, uh, Tobias, for your answers, for the presentation, and a lot of great insights. Just for the people who are right now are in the session or the ones who are watching this event after the event is concluded, if you're watching the recordings, you're going to find the links included where you can find also Tobias' contacts, including email, LinkedIn, and his company uh, details too, where you can privately reach out if you're a government institution, researcher, company, uh, anything that you're feeling there's an alignment of interest, obviously uh, find his contact details and, and, and make sure to reach out. Uh, Tobias, so greatly appreciate your time. Uh, it's it's fascinating to have you on uh, for this year. Hopefully we can catch up and I'm sure you're going to have a lot of additional things to share for next year. And hopefully we can do that. But for today, look, I wish you a lot of great success. We definitely going to uh, keep uh, keep keep our noses in terms of what Biosurf is doing on uh, in terms of social media, following the news and whatnot. I mean, everything what you do is very, very important for the future exploration of space and especially when it comes to human travel. So thank you for that. And, and I wish you best best of luck and a great day. Definitely. Yes. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening. And um, as you said, definitely reach out to me if you have any questions. Always happy to to help. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care.